on engaging men in healthy relationships. And here's Don McPherson for you. Thank you, Dolly. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining the call this morning. Um, by way of further introduction, uh, Dolly did mention, knowing that Joe, Josie and I are first cousins. Um, so if you hear us laugh at different times, it's because we have a lot of laughter in our family. Um, but, and, of course, Josie was going to be all serious and not say that. So, um, so um, let, me, uh, let me also begin by letting everyone know and that uh, I'm at a remote location, so I'm going to be asking uh, Josie and Dolly to forward each slide as we proceed. Um, and then they'll be letting me know if there are questions as we go along. But I just wanted to let, let people know that because um, sometimes you tend to, I tend, tend to talk to myself um, in, a, in a forum like this and, and not be connected. So um, just by further uh, introduction, if we can go to the next slide, um, by further introduction to the work that I do and also what I want to cover in this is I'm going to challenge some of our thinking around how we conduct sexual assault prevention programming and, and in, in particular how we engage men in that conversation and, and also to the broader conversation around relationships, look at different ways in which, which I and my work and, and, and others um, define relationships and, and some of the different ways in which we address um, sexual violence and once again engaging men. So um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on my background in history. I, I think um, I'm, only, I'm only doing that because I, I want folks to know where this is coming from and a little bit of my background in philosophy and some of the work that I've done that's really going to hopefully inform my perspective as we get into to the two-year assessment um, and analysis uh, of the work of this work throughout higher education. Um, and as you can see, a, a critique of, of the, the status quo um, in, in the current work and, and various approaches that are used. Um, and, and then finally, um, some of the recommendations that um, some of which I'm, I'm currently in, engaged and others that are proposals with different institutions and organizations that I work with um, throughout the country. So um, if we go to the next slide, um, as Dolly said, I was a um, college football player at Syracuse many years ago. Hard to see on that slide, um, and I apologize for that, but it's not really important information. Um, I was a college football player at Syracuse. Uh, I'm from Long Island. I've, I've been in New York my whole life. I live back on Long Island currently. Um, I started working many years ago, more than 35 years ago, actually, when I was a, a student at Syracuse University with the drunk driving program. So I've been working in schools throughout New York State for a, well, well over a quarter of a century, um, doing work on leadership programs and educational programs, everything from drunk driving to alcohol and substance abuse prevention programming, bullying, hazing, just name all the issues that we've dealt with uh, in, in high schools throughout those years, um, specifically on this issue of, of men's violence against women um, and sexual and domestic violence. It's been since 1994 when I retired from football that I started doing work specifically around issues of men's violence against women. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, and that has been 25 years of, of doing this work, and I say 25 years of, of advocacy work and leadership work, doing work with men. Um, just talking about this earlier today, it was on the Oprah Winfrey Show back in 2002 and uh, served on the board of the Men's Foundation with Women. For, um, and, and obviously, we all know Gloria Steinem. And, and, um, uh, and in the middle is, is Vital Voices, which is an agency. Actually, I'm down here in Washington, D.C. Um, was did an event with them last night. Uh, they're a global NGO working on, on women's empowerment around the world. And, um, so I've been doing this work for, for a very long time. Uh, if we go to the, the next slide, um, this, this is an important sort of subtext to this conversation. As I said, 35 years of, of doing this work. Um, I always say that, that the work that I do um, and the things that I say in, in my programs are all issues that we've all been raised not to talk about. I started doing work in, in drunk driving prevention, alcohol substance abuse prevention, recognizing that those problems in our families are problems that get passed down generation to generation. It's usually the silence of our families that allows those problems to pass generation to generation. And so, um, and, and our inability to have those conversations, we, and we tend to use uh, what I refer to as prevention language and scare tactics and, and telling everybody, people and students and young people in particular um, what's going to happen to them if they do the wrong thing and, and trying to use um, the tragedies to teach and, and, and the, the problem to teach as opposed to truly teaching people how to make good decisions using good information 
and, and all this information. That's exactly how I got involved in the issue of, of men's violence against women. And I, when I retired from football in 1994, I went to work at Northeastern University at the Center for the Study of Sport and Society. And that's when I met Jackson Cat. And, and the importance of, of meeting Jackson was that I came to this work around sexual violence not as a perpetrator, not as a survivor, um, not even as someone who felt uh, particularly impacted by the issue. I was a, a football player and an educator, uh, and when I went to Northeastern University, I learned from Jackson about understanding uh, all forms of, and why I refer to it as men's violence against women, all forms of sexual and domestic violence and, and all its forms are essentially men committing acts of violence against women. There's violence in so many different ways and so many different populations but overwhelmingly, if we look at violent behavior, it is overwhelmingly men and boys. And there's a, a real need um, to address issues of masculinity, and that's how I came to this work. Um, I also say that I came to this work because of men, but also men like Jackson were inspired and educated by women who invited men into the space. And as I always say, that I was invited into this work by women to use my privilege as a former athlete, as a man, to talk to other men about dismantling that which gives me privilege, which is a pretty precarious place if, if you think about communicating with men about dismantling patriarchy and sexism and misogyny. Um, it, it's, a, it's a compelling, and, and obviously that, that is the crux of the, of the conversation. Uh, but for me as a man, I very often felt that in having those conversations with men and being invited by women, to do the work, I was often more accountable to the women who weren't in the room than to the men who are in the room. And that's a, a process. It's a very delicate process. But it's also the key to a sustainable conversation with men is, is having a conversation around masculinity, recognizing that the same things you're talking to them around masculinity are the, the, are the foundations of all forms of men's violence against women. But in order to have a sustainable conversation we have to pivot from that conversation with men that is solely about issues of, of preventing men's violence against women and really talk to men about what is it that we want for our sons? What is it that we want for each other? How, how do we define masculinity in a more broad sense that includes being nonviolent and non-misogynistic and, and sexist and, and all, the, all the ways, all the fundamental ways that lead to men's violence against women? That is what I refer to as aspirational masculinity. It's a, it's a conversation around masculinity that we have not achieved, which is why I use the word aspirational, uh, because it has to be inclusive. It has to be, it, it has to be uh, welcoming um, to, to everyone, in particular men that have been uh, historically left out of the conversation. So that's, that's essentially where, um, you know, as I said, my, my philosophy. And if we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll move through these next pretty quickly because I, I did talk about some of the different um, boards I've served on, Stop It Now, which is a child sexual abuse organization, uh, U U.S. National Committee for UN Women, the News Foundation I mentioned a moment ago, and the Center for the Studies of Men and Masculinity at Stony Brook University. Um, if we go to the next slide, and again, we'll go quickly. Um, over the, these 25 years, this title, You Throw Like a Girl, uh, which I'll get to in, in a second, has been the title of a lecture that I've, 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 uh, I've done on more than 350 college campuses and communities um, throughout North America um, over those last 25 years and continue to do that work on a, on a regular basis. Um, and the next slide is um, specifically as a former student athlete, um, I've been an advisor with the NCAA um, since the NCAA started addressing issues of sexual violence, um, specifically going back to 2011, which was shortly after the Dear Colleague letter was published. Um, at convention that year, uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, excuse me, President Mark Emmett of the, of the uh, NCAA invited me on a panel that led to a many-year engagement with the NCAA around uh, these issues, and that came after the death of Yardley Love, a student at University of Virginia, who was murdered by her boyfriend, who was also a lacrosse player at Virginia. Um, over those years, we have done, and most of the work with the NCAA has not been sports-related. It really has been engaging the higher education community using sports as the platform as sort of the, the hub to have this conversation. And so uh, the folks that we've always brought to the table have been um, people who would help inform the conversation, in particular, how does athletics fit in, in, in that conversation. And the document, the photograph on the right is um, the toolkit, and, it, and this is available on the NCAA's website. It was recently updated. Uh, so for those of you who are interested in 
how to engage athletics on the college campus and how to keep athletics engaged in the campus community around this conversation. That's what the toolkit was designed to do was not to have athletics function in isolation on campus, but really to be integrated in other efforts that are going on, going on across campus. Um, so that's the toolkit, and that's why there's an asterisk next to it. Uh, the original document was created in 2016, and as I said, um, it was updated just this past year, so there's a, an updated version of that toolkit. The NCAA the task force that I served on was responsible for, the, for publishing that document, um, that publication. Following that, the NCAA created another uh, body, which was the, the Board of Governors, which is the college president, the Board of Governors Commission to Combat Campus Sexual Assault. I was a member of that commission as well, and that was the body that made the recommendation that all athletic departments have to do something, and we never just define what that something is. So it could be involved in being involved in, in um, campus activities. It can be bringing in a speaker, which um, I'm not always a fan, a fan of, uh, but it, and, and a number of other programs, and I'll, I'll cite this later on, a number of other programs that are out there um, throughout higher education uh, that, that athletic departments can employ. Um, that was, I believe, in 2017 that, that that policy was enacted, and the college president, the athletic director, and the faculty athletic rep, which is the member from the faculty that, that works with athletics, has to attest that they did something, that each campus did something. Uh, that, by the way, just for um, a reference, that, that um, record of which schools have attested to doing something uh, is, I believe, public record. I know that the NCAA is keeping uh, tabs on that, um, but I believe it is public record to find out which schools have done something and which schools have not. Um, and it's something that we were very adamant about, making sure that the, that information was public so people um, know what, what schools are doing. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so um, that uh, adorable young boy is the grandson of a, a woman that I went to high school with, Rosie Fantosi, um, and, and Rosie gave me permission to use that picture because as the book was published last month, um, people started posting pictures of them with the book, and this was Rosie's picture of her grandson with the book, which is my favorite uh, favorite picture. But the, the book, um, as I mentioned, and as, as Dolly mentioned in the introduction, um, is uh, chronicles of the last 35 years, because there's a lot of, of my work in schools, uh, including the book, but, but more specifically um, gets into issues of men's violence against women. And the blind spot of masculinity, and this is important and germane to this conversation, uh, one of the issues that I, I deal with in the book is privilege, and that, that I have been privileged as a man to not have to worry about sexual violence. And, and I don't mean that in a way that I have not paid attention to it, um, prior to starting this work, because I saw I saw that it, saw it in, in my life in various ways, but it wasn't my issue, and that was one of the first things I learned from Jackson was that it is a men's issue, it is my issue, and so um, as I say in the book, when I met Jackson, he helped me understand uh, a privilege I did not know, I did not know I had to you to address a problem I did not know was mine, and that is a big part of what the book is about. Um, and it's, it's also, it gets into what I refer to as the blind spot of masculinity. And that blind spot is important because that is the fact that because men have privilege to not have to deal with this issue, we have not. And that has kept us out of the, uh, out of the discussion, especially around, um, not just obviously around the issues of, of men's violence against women, but also the, the discussion around masculinity and what does it mean to be a healthy and whole man. And that's a, a robust conversation that, that is necessary in our culture now more than ever, um, and one that, that I focus on, um, as I said earlier, getting away, not necessarily getting away from, as in not addressing, but, but moving the, the, the dialogue with men uh, into that area of how do we help the next generation of young boys uh, be nonviolent, um, be more inclusive, um, in, in all the ways that are necessary in the context of this conversation. Uh, and then more broadly, um, as of the last chapter of my book is titled, Be Your Son's Father, Not Your Father's Son. And it's all about how do we, how do we raise the next generation of men, given that we, as, as, as in our current generation or my generation, I'm 54 years old, um, didn't have the role models that taught us um, how to, to look at masculinity more broadly than we currently do. So... Um, that's a, a little bit of, of sort of where I'm coming from and 
my background on, on this and, and wanted to go into sort of the, the next, if we can go to the next slide and then the next slide, um, the assessment of the status quo. Um, so just to, uh, to give you a, 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 a sense of I'll, I will do this and then um, I will pause um, in a couple of slides to, to uh, take any questions or if there's anything that comes up um, as, as I go through these next three slides. Um, but just to give you a background, I spent time on, on one particular campus over the last few years and met with everyone. It says 150 meetings, um, but it was everyone on this campus um, from students on up to the president, chancellor's office of the institution, of everyone who was engaged in and or not, but um, were impacted by issues of sexual and relationship violence on that campus. Um, to get an assessment of what's going on, um, what's reaching the ground, what kind of education is reaching students, um, how students feel about it, how faculty and administrators are feeling about it, uh, tell you why, and staff, why those folks are important in a moment. Um, and during that time, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there were other work I was doing nationally. I mentioned the work with the NCAA and the Board of Governors Commission, um, as well as the various think tanks that were conducted, uh, uh, as well as workshops. And, and, and lectures um, on an, a, another 18 college campuses nationally, um, and in some cases doing more comprehensive work, doing some assessment of what, what campuses were doing, what programs they were using, um, as well as um, just doing workshops and lectures with students um, and various faculty, staff, and administrators. Um, in that time, and I'm gonna talk about this in the next slide, the Sexual Assault Awareness Month analysis you know, um, is, is something I'll get to in the next, in a minute, but I want to address that last bullet um, at the bottom of, of this page, and that is the one, the double B there is one billion dollar problem. Um, and, and I say aggregate cost to, to three institutions, I always add, add a fourth, but if you add up what it has cost, Penn State, Michigan State, and USC, and then you add Baylor into the mix, and I'll tell you why Baylor is an outlier in what I'm, in what I'm talking about. Those four institutions, will pay out more than a billion dollars in settlement costs that are the result of the silence of men that allowed other men to be sexual predators over time. And so it, as I talked about earlier, the silence that allows problems to continue. And I say the silence of men because there were men in leadership positions that allowed Jerry Sandusky at, at Penn State, that allowed Larry Nassar at Michigan State, that allowed two different positions at USC uh, to have multiple victims over the course of many years in all three of those cases, it is an aggregate cost of more than a billion dollars. At Baylor, uh, the perpetrators in the violence at Baylor that has cost more than 52 rape claims um, and another couple hundred million dollars in settlement money, um, they were student athletes. But, but those student athletes were allowed to do that because of the silence of the head football coach, Art Bryles, and the president, um, Ken Starr, who uh, ironically is that Ken Starr. Um, who were silent in the face of all of the sexual violence that was happening on our campus. And the reason I bring that up is because so much attention is paid to how we educate students on campus, how we educate uh, athletes on campus or fraternity members on campus. And there is a wake up that, that needs to happen in higher education. And, and this is why I tell people the Me Too movement happened at, in, within higher education long before Me Too. And it was the Dear Colleague Letter of 2011. It was uh, The Hunting Ground, the film that was released shortly thereafter. It was. It was Missoula, the book around the University of uh, uh, Montana, um, um, that that have led to these major, major, and, and the work that, that people were doing in the Olympic movement with Larry Nasser uh, that brought so many, 300, more than 350 women forward. Um, that has, has been going on. There's a tremendous cost to institutions, and this is why what's happened, um, and I'm going to get into this in the next slide, what's happened over the last several years is that we've gone to a, a, a litigious society, we, we, we've, we've, we've stopped doing education, and we've just hired lawyers to, to help mitigate the impact of that billion dollar problem that I mentioned in the last slide. And so this is essentially how I look at, at what is going on on college campuses. And, and this is, I, I don't like to be um, sort of the, you know, the downer of, of, this, of this kind of where we are in this, but we have to look at what we're doing, and, and is it working, is it having impact? And I will tell you that not just in the schools that I work with, but in, in a number of schools, a number of campuses that I go to, I've been on campuses that have 14, 15, 16, 20,000 students, and there are two or three people in the office 
that is charged with doing sexual assault prevention programming and awareness. And so you have this understaffed and overwhelmed offices who are charged with this kind of, with, with, with prevention programming. Uh, I'm going to go through sort of the, the, the problems as I see them before I get into the solutions because I think many people on the call would understand what some of the solutions are because it's the work that you all do, I'm sure, tirelessly um, on, on, on a daily basis. The second problem that, that I saw, and I mentioned this earlier when I said that the NCAA required schools to do something, but there was no teeth to what it was, they were required to do. Therefore, anyone can do anything. And so you have various programs that are, are out there in, in the public, um, whether it's It's On Us or One Love or uh, Green Dot, all these different programs. Obviously, the programs that I work with, like MVP and Huddle Up and Step Up, there are all these different programs. Those are programs that come from the outside. And then there are camp, campus-based programs. We have, you have some, you know, student-led activism and, and other folks on campus that have been doing things uh, for a very long time, and they have their own programs. And so what ends up happening is that you can have a, a campus, whether it's a campus of, of, of 1,500 students or 15,000 students, and you will have different messaging across different departments. Unfortunately, athletics seems to, you know, sit out there by itself no matter what size the campus and then you have a counseling office doing one thing, and you have maybe have an, an office in health promotion or an office in sexual violence prevention on campus maybe doing something else. And so there's um, a lack of consistent messaging, and therefore um, not just messaging, but, but the kind of education that you're putting out there for students. The next problem, as I see it, um, is one that is not without some pushback from a lot of people, as some of this is from, from a lot of people. But, but I say it's an over-reliance on student-led activism. There's a reason they're called students. They're still learning, and we, we have kind of, in my opinion, as, as administrators in, in higher education, have acquiesced uh, the burden of this problem to students. We ask them to table. We ask them to do take back the night. We ask them to do all these things where, where they tell their stories, if, if they are survivors, uh, where they're in charge of doing peer-to-peer -peer sex education, which is, once again, they're students. Um, and and, and have, we have not given them a tremendous amount of direction of how to teach them to be better advocates, to teach them to be better educators um, and, and engage these issues in a way that's not just about, or, or around um, telling survivor stories and, and asking them to do um, events during one month out of the year. Um, the next two slides I'm, I'm going to talk about later on, and they're pretty self-explanatory. The biggest two issues of this problem, as I see it in, in and around higher education and around our, our culture, one is a lack of a comprehensive education around sex, and um, as we'll get into in a moment, um, uh, not an inadequate way of engaging men um, in, in, this, in this conversation. Uh, the last problem is something that, that um, I uh, mentioned earlier, that $1 billion problem, and if it's that big of a problem, there should not be, going back to the first board, there should not be a, um, you know, two, two people in, in an office charged with, with doing this work. Um, and, and if I can go back up to, to the solution for the first problem, is one of the things that we very often miss, and I'm the person who gets hired very often to go to college campuses and speak, and I go in for a day and I leave. And the thing that I know on every campus that I go to, with very few exceptions, is that there are people on that campus who are interested in, in having this dialogue, who are having this dialogue maybe in their coursework, maybe in, in, the, in their curricula, uh, or, or, or in, in their background, um, and, and we are not doing an adequate job to educate the, the entire community and, and taking advantage of a lot of the expertise um, that is on campus. Obviously, the solution, the solution to um, the lack of consistent messaging is I believe that the campuses should bring together uh, folks from, from all these disparate offices and departments on campus to come up with guiding principles. How do you define your campus as, as it relates to these issues in ways in which you agree across all different disciplines and offices on campus so that there is a common language that then informs the kind of people that you bring onto your campus, the kind of the outside programs you bring onto your campus, the kind of the ways in which you outreach to students. Um, I mentioned the, the over-reliance on student-led activism. Um, I do believe that we should be doing a better job of helping students find ways to be social activists around these issues. I, I came from the home last night of a, a, a colleague here in Washington, D.C., whose daughter was sexually assaulted, and he is learning how to be a better advocate. And as a father, 
it, it's a difficult conversation for him to not just use the, his power and his influence in, in his business or as a man to, to just go after the school that did not um, deal with his daughter's sexual assault properly, but how does he as a man create a sustainable program, a sustainable conversation that, is, that goes beyond just the activism of the moment? And so I'm working with him now in, in helping him understand how to do that and how to do that in the space that he occupies in his corporate community. I think we need to do the same thing for students because they don't all come from a quote-unquote sexual assault world. They are in economics, they're in communications, they're in different departments on campus, and we have to teach them how they can use their experience and their activism to inform those other places that, that they occupy. Um, so getting into the, the, the next few slides, I just want to go to the next slide. Um, and, and this, to me, was sort of a, a, a big issue that really um, bothered me quite a bit about how college campuses are addressing sexual assault uh, on campus and how we're doing education work. And I started pressing people um, on various campuses, asking them if they know why we do Sexual Assault Awareness Month in, in April. And I, and I won't go through the, the whole history, but the Pennsylvania Coalition Against, uh, Against Rape, uh, Delilah Lumberg was, was the, the executive director when I was on one of their committees many years ago, and they created Sexual Assault Awareness Month to help um, state by state sexual assault agencies like like in like I said to to do activism, to do education, to do fundraising, to raise awareness, and it was a counter to um, to to NC, NC, um, NCADV to do the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence created. Um, Domestic Violence Awareness, Awareness Month in October, and Sexual Assault Needed This Month. And April was a great month for, uh, for PCAR and for others to do this kind of work or kind of awareness. It's the worst month to do this on college campuses. It is the month before summer vacation, before internships start, before graduation, all the final exams, all these things that are going on. And, and during that month, we don't talk about solutions. We talk about the problems. And, and it's been increasingly, and, and this is where I'm, I'm always open to criticism from people pushing back on my lens, which is why I kind of gave you all my background at the beginning of the things that we don't talk about and the things that we don't say. And increasingly I'm watching that, that we, we end up using survivors and their stories to do the work. And we do this in, in April where we have Take Back the Night or Walk a Mile in Our Shoes or, uh, or the Clothesline Project. I was on a campus recently in the Midwest where they don't allow, there's no money in the state to do prevention. And so the, the sort of the prevention in April was having the, the close of victims of sexual and domestic violence in a display to say this is what she was wearing when she was murdered. And, 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 I, and I walked into this room where this display was going on on a campus about a year ago, and I broke down in tears. And, and because it was just, it was just such a, a gut-wrenching display. And, and this was under the guise of prevention. And this was done just like everything else I'm saying in April. And, and we do it, uh, you know, on my campus in Syracuse, they, they do something called Mayfest, which is a, a complete drunken party in a park adjacent to campus that signifies the end of the academic year and, and all the things that was just graduation and finals are over and all that. And that happens shortly after we have students tabling on campus trying to get other people to recognize Take Back the Night. And, and, and it just, it's starting to bother me more and more that we're, we're using students and their trauma um, as a way of doing prevention work. And we do that in the last month, and then and everyone, everyone leaves. Uh, and so this, to me, is, is the epitome of the flawed approach um, of doing sexual assault prevention programming on campus. And let me, let me pause now and, and, and see if there are any questions um, with folks on the call, if Joe's have any questions in the chat. Um, and I'll just take a quick pause to see if there are. Does anyone have any questions that you would like to post in the chat box? As of right now, there have been none. Okay. Everyone is. So, um, I would. Okay. Um, continue. Oh, wait. We have a question. Okay. I guess they're typing it out, so let's just give a minute. Okay. Anyone else has any questions they'd like to type in right now? 
we also have some a, a great comment about um, an amazing points that that you're making, Don. Say it again. Um, we we'll just have a comment towards you that you're making amazing points. Oh, um, oh thank throughout you. Throughout your presentation here, and, and ditto. Um, so this particular individual says, "I'm enjoying your perspective. Never thought about April in this way. Absolutely, that's where that, that's where my mind went. Like, wow, such so you're supposed to be doing such great things. But the point that you brought up is is really poignant as to how we're just re-traumatizing ourselves through that and not really focusing on how to deal with the with the issue. Um, and so specifically, um, what about for um, so? Sorry." She asked, um, what would you suggest we do instead of waiting for April? And mm -hmm. another person asked, what are your thoughts on making students being paraprofessionals or community leaders during the month of April, specifically ones who are not victims of or survivors? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to get into um, part of that, what we should be doing um, um, prior to the month of April. Um, I'll get into that in, in, in the course of this. Um, and, and the point about, about making students paraprofessionals, I think, and, and, I, and I'll, I'll reiterate the point, I think that's fine if we train them to do so. And I think that's a, a key point, especially because what ends up happening, and, and, and to the question about the students who are not survivors, which, which is an excellent question because very often the students who are engaged are survivors. And in, in in various forms, and so we have to help them see the the uh, the broader picture of why they should be engaged in the conversation. For example, I I have I start most of my presentations now um, by helping this generation of students, um, giving them a little bit of a call to action. This is a generation of college students right now um, who were in middle school or grade school when Sandy Hook happened. And they watched an adult culture and they're like, do nothing and see, and see it get worse. Instead of, instead of really addressing the problem, we're teaching them how to hide underneath a desk and have active shooter drills. And, and, then, and then they're listening to our debate about gun violence and, and not going anywhere. It's the same exact thing. And, and there are many adults who are annoyed that it, a, a kids are watching. I, I mentioned um, – the family I, I was with last night who hosted a book signing at their home, uh, their oldest daughter was sexually assaulted. The youngest daughter was sitting, we were sitting around at the end of the evening, and the youngest daughter, who's just 13, uh, was in the room. And I, here I am with the parents, not the daughter who was a survivor, but the parents and, two, and their two other daughters. And the parents were saying how their youngest daughter, during the trial, during all the proceedings after this, was and the parents were trying to shield her from everything. Or what what happened to her older sister? And that child was sitting right next to me on the couch, and she and she said, "I found out everything. I went online. I I could hear every conversation in this household, and and put pieces together. And she found out everything that happened to her sister, and everything that went on. Meanwhile, the parents were trying to hide her from it, and they weren't helping her. And and so we had this really you know engaged and and really tr um, open conversation." Um, with the youngest daughter, and and so um, this is a generation that that is watching us keep things out of the public discourse. And so one of the things that I start with with the students now is I talk about Sandy Hook, I talk about Pittsburgh, and how a, a 98 year old Jew was killed in her synagogue for being a Jew in Pittsburgh in 2018, and and how that is our culture, and we have to come to terms with that. And, and it's up to this generation, the same, you know, these kids have been told that the Amazon is so important and it's, 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 it's so important to our, our, you know, our clean air and to the ecosystem of our, of our planet, and yet they're watching it burn and they don't, they don't see us doing anything about it. And so that's my way of saying it's up to you as a generation to step up and start addressing these issues in, in a more transparent and a more forceful way. And we're seeing it. We're seeing it now with, with students who are uh, the Parkland students and other students who are stepping up. And so, yes, we do want students to be more uh, informed and be more engaged, but that's going to require that we, we give them the education they need uh, to, be, to be social change agents. And, and Don, um, someone else to piggyback on that saying, you know, do you have any ideas as to 
you know, what should be offered in that direction? How should we be educating um, students? Should we offer a social justice class or an advocacy class? And also, um, has there been any talks on a national level of changing um, Sexual Assault Awareness Month um, from April to another month? Or me personally, I just want to add this, do you even believe that we should even be focusing a month on any of it? Do you even think it's even effective to do it in that fashion anyway? So my, my answer to that is, no, there is nothing going on nationally about changing that. I think people mm -hmm. are doing, as I said, I think throughout higher education, um, we are in a really bad place in higher education. We, we, and I say we collectively, higher education, has spent the last several years hiring lawyers and not educators. In fact, we've gotten rid of educators in, in the place of lawyers. Um, when the Dear Colleague letter was written, one of the things that happened was that many college campus advocates lost their confidentiality and they lost their jobs. And, and I know of, of several amazing people that were colleagues and friends who were advocates on campus. They weren't attorneys. They had confidentiality. They were helping so many students who came to them in confidence who did not want to go down the legal process. They wanted to heal. They wanted to, to learn and grow, and they wanted to be part of the solution. And that got taken away when the Dear Colleague letter, not just when it was written, but when it was applied. Um, and then, sadly, this new administration has come in, and Betsy DeVos has come in and tried to redefine um, what sexual assault is and how it should be adjudicated. And so now you have all those lawyers that were hired to adjudicate sexual assault complaints, and now they're all sitting on their hands. And they're sitting on their hands because they don't want to be sued by um, the accused because that's happening. And, and they're also waiting for the federal government to define sexual violence and sexual assault. It is an absolute ridiculous space that higher education is in right now. And, and so there's very little from my lens, and, and I'm sure there are some people in my field who would tell me that I'm wrong, um, that is happening to advance the conversation in a, in a more collective uh, way that is progressive and understands that, and I'm going to get into this in a moment, Sexual Assault Awareness Month is ridiculous. It's not a month. It's every single day. Our students are engaged in, in relationships. They're engaged in, in um, negotiating relationships. They're engaged in uh, multiple different ways. I'm going to talk about this in a minute, in ways we say interact with each other every single day. Waiting for a month to have this conversation minimalizes it and trivializes it. And so what's important that they understand is that this is not just something that you do in a single month, but something that you do every single day that you are a student at that institution. And, and so um, that is what, what is um, most important that we address in, um, uh, in this issue, is that, is that we make this an everyday conversation and not something that just happens during a month. That's just my, my personal feeling. And, and as for – Sort of what we get into, uh, what needs to happen, and I'll, I will go into this and, and tell you that there are certain concepts and um, that are out there now that I think are very helpful, um, that are part of the solution, but I think they're being misused, and they're being misused in ways because they they were turned into sort of the cottage industry that was created several years ago after the Dear Colleague letter, after some high profile cases in and around higher education that that created a bigger a bigger dialogue. Um, throughout higher ed. So let me, let me do that with you now and go through, we can go to the next slide because one of those um, tools that has been used um, over the years is bystander. Um, and, and to give folks some history on bystander, because this is really important, and I, and I have the date wrong actually um, in that. It wasn't introduced in 93, excuse me, 94. It was actually 90, 1993. It was the year before. 94 was the year that I got to um, Northeastern University at the Center for the Study of Sport and Society. And it was the work of Ron Slaby and Jackson Katz. Ron Slaby at the Educational Development Center was doing his research on bystander and bullying um, behavior. And, and that was something, and, and Ron was a professor of Jackson's um, at UMass and um, and, and so when Jackson started doing work around men's violence against women and wanted to introduce bystanders to the work around men's violence against women, they reconnected and created the Mentors and Violence Prevention Program in early 1994. I arrived in Northeastern later in 94, and that's when I started doing this work. And so th this is a very important part about what's happened with bystander. It's bystander behavior that was introduced to the field, not bystander intervention. 
it's a, it's a very, very important distinction, and it gets to the question posed earlier about what do we do throughout the course of the year. If we are only talking to men about preventing, or people in general, about preventing an incident from happening, preventing a sexual assault from happening, whatever it is, then we're just asking men to, to, to uh, and people to act in the moment. The work that Jackson was trying to do was to enable men, as it says in the second bullet there, to enable men to confront the culture of masculinity with and among each other. And, and, and this, is, this is what's so important about why bystander was introduced. It was introduced to get to the behaviors that lead to perpetration and the attitudes that lead to perpetration, to stop them before they develop. One of the things that I talk about in, in, the, in my work, is, especially as, a, as an athlete, is that in the classroom, in, the, in theater, in athletics, in anywhere we, um, we have to perform or we have to act in the heat of the moment, Right? The heat of the moment is the day you take an exam. The heat of the moment is the day you play a game or the day that, that you, the, the curtain rises in, in, in theater. It's the day you perform. And, and what we do in the classroom is we prepare to make good decisions in the heat of the moment. This is no different. And I'm not just talking about sexual violence. It's all social issues. It's, it's what informs the heat of the moment. What attitudes do you bring to that moment? What beliefs do you bring to that moment? And, and with regard to this issue of, of men's violence against women, I always – parallel uh, a football game and its final minutes being won uh, in the final minutes because you've practiced and prepared for that final minute. And I go through what happens in, on, on, you know, on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. The same thing is true. I parallel a sexual assault that actually happened when I was in college many years ago. Uh, but I also talk about the behavior in, uh, in the locker room earlier in the week or, or in the dorm earlier in the week when guys are talking about oh, what they're going to do in the weekend and how much they egg each other on. Hey, we're going to do this, and we're going to get messed up, we're going to get drunk, and we're going to get laid, and we're going to do all these things. And then all the things that lead up to a sexual assault. Hey, man, there's that, that girl you're like, hey, buy her a beer. Hey, man, she bought the beer, right? You're in, right? Just like, you know, the, the, the Donald Trump, right? He scored before he even got off the bus. And, and, and those were moments that men confront each other and confront the attitudes that lead to, the, lead to sexual violence. And so... What bystander was introduced to do was to get men, independent and absent of women, to confront each other when those things come up, when those things are said, when those attitudes are revealed, and say, hey, man, you know, no, that's not the way we're supposed to behave. And no, no, don't buy our beer, man. You know what? Don't we, have we heard of alcohol consent you know, for all these years? And the whole point of bystander was not to be a see something, say something. But what's happened in this field is because the ways in which we are talking to men is because of the toxicity that impacts women's lives. As I said to you all earlier, I was invited into this work by women who asked me to use my privilege to address other men. That's what bystander is. That's how I came to this work. It was, it was and why bystander in the way that Jackson presented it, Ron Slavin presented it, was so appealing to me. It wasn't that I was going to become the bouncer at every party, but it was because I had the ability to talk to men, as I did last night with Alex Prout in his home, about what is our responsibility as men in this conversation. What is, what is it, how do we have to interrupt misogyny and sexism in our own language, in the, even when it's joking, even when it's not meant to be malicious or, or, uh, or have some sort of ill intent in the casual ways in which we talk. That's why bystander was, was created. Unfortunately, it's been many ways, it's been co-opted by the field that just wants to stop sexual violence. It says when, you, when this happens, you see something, you say something. It's that see something, say something mentality. It's that it's why we want the, the football team to be the bystanders, not because we want them to be better, but because of the football team, right? And they'll stop the fight from happening because they're bigger and, and blah, blah, blah. That's the wrong approach. That's not an appealing approach to many men. That's not, going, that's not a sustainable approach. And, and the other thing that happens, and, there's, and, and I'm crit critical of, of others in this field who have taken out the gender analysis from bystanders. And there's a prominent program that takes out the gender analysis from bystanders and says everyone can be a bystander. Well, here's the problem with that, that philosophy. If everyone's a bystander, then no one's a bystander. We're right back to square one because everyone's waiting for the person who's bigger, the person who has more social capital, the person who has less to, to lose to do something, or the person who's more outspoken to do something. So we're all still waiting for someone. Hey, John was in that presentation. John's a bigger guy. He's a bystander too. Let John do that. And so – if, you, if everyone's a bystander, then no one's a bystander. And that's a problem with, with what's happened to bystander and because it's become more about around intervention and, and not 
truly about its fundamental purpose, which was to get men, and I would go further than that and say not just men, but men and women, but even men and women in their affinity groups, how you confront your group, which is always the most, in, in the bystander intervention model, the risk to intervening is very often physical. You know, that person may have a weapon. That person may turn on me. In the bystander behavior model, the risk is social. I'm going to be ostracized from the group. I'm going to, uh, if, I, if I just let this, you know, if I'm in the locker room and, and guys are talking about women in a certain way, if I confront that, then I'm going to be excluded from the group. How do I do that? How do I confront that in that moment with my teammates, with my fraternity members, in a way that advances the conversation? And that's what needs to happen to the earlier question during the course of the year and not waiting for April to say, hey, we're going to do bystander intervention training and teach people how to intervene. And so that's one thing. Um, the second thing, if, if we go to the um, next, and we can go to the next um, slide for a second, and, um, and, and I'll go very quickly on the slide because we've covered it, I've covered a lot of this already. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, okay. Is, is, well, no, actually, I, let me go back because I'm, I'm on it. I missed that slide. Okay, so this is another concept that we use very often, and um, once again, often gets misused, and, and, and I, I have, and I'm going to go from the bottom up on, on, uh, on this. Actually, I'll, I'll start with the bottom on women and consent. My problem with consent is the way that it's taught is that it's permission. It's a legal term. It's you get permission to do something. That's what consent is. And, and we did that because, as I said earlier, we hired more lawyers than educators. And the lawyers are saying, well, there was, was there consent? And, what, and now you have, because we've been driving home this thing about getting consent, You'll have, an, and I'm, this is not coming from me. This is coming from a colleague of mine who's an attorney who does this work, who's looking at what sort of the unintended outcomes of this. You have to get permission. Is a guy will 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 te he'll text a, a, a woman early in the, in the in the week. Hey, we're gonna hook up on Saturday, and she says, Oh yeah, I can't wait, right? And he's got it on his phone. He thinks he has consent, right? She said, We're gonna hook up. We're gonna do this, and and that's actually been used as a, as a quote unquote, you know, well, well look, she's it's on my phone. She texted the other day. She's She's down, and she was giving me permission. And, and so we're not teaching students and young people how to navigate and negotiate and have conversations around. Consent is not just getting permission to do, as men have been, have been taught, to do something to women. It has to be a conversation that's two ways. And, and I even take this to, to a, a, a more broader definition of what consent is. If I am in that locker room and, and I am silent, to my teammates who are talking in a misogynistic and sexist way, I'm giving consent to my teammates that that is okay and that I'm okay with this conversation going on in my midst. And so I'm going to talk a little bit later about, about relationships and how they're more broad than intimate relationships. And that's another way we have to look at. You are giving, you are giving consent to your teammates to, to have this attitude around you if it's something you disagree with. And, and that's part of the education process of how do you get them to um, – to talk in relationships, but in particular, when in the middle, the middle bullet, if we are not teaching, and, and I'm going to talk very specifically about boys, if we are not teaching boys that sex is something that you do with women, that you experience with women, that means that you are responsive, you are communicative, you are, uh, it's an egalitarian experience, and we help them define what that is, if we are not having a deliberate conversation with them, with young people about sexual behavior, then consent for many boys is to do to women what they see in porn. And I'm going to say that very bluntly, and people can push back on me. I've been asking questions to students for at least 20 years that I've been doing this work. And, I'll, and, the, and the question is how many of people in the, in the room got a graphic, honest, and sustained conversation about sexual behavior, intimacy, their bodies, from the people who raised them? The people who taught them, please and thank you, yes, ma'am, no, sir. The people who taught them how to be young, young men and gentlemen and all that, how many of them got a graphic, honest, and sustained conversation? The hands in the room are no more now than they were 20 years when I started asking that question. We are not talking to young people in a comprehensive way about sexual behavior, and young boys now have pornography that in 1977, when I first saw porn, I walked two, two miles to see it in a movie theater. It was the same movie theater where I saw Jaws and the Aristocats with my family. It was not some shady back alley movie theater. It was the movie theater in Limbrook on Long Island, like I said, right across from, from, from the pizzeria where we all had dinner right before we went to the movie. And now 
the pornography that young boys have on their phones in their pocket at six, seven, eight, nine years old is not just graphic and sustained. It is violent, misogynistic, and it is rape by category. And and as I've asked that question of students, they are more. It could be a room of a thousand students in the room, and I ask that question, and they all know what the hub is, and the hub is Pornhub, and they all know it. And and as young as 12, 13 years old, I talk to boys and girls, and they know what this stuff is. I don't get into the conversation about what it is, but they know it. And yet adults are still not talking. So when we talk about consent, what are we asking students and young people to get consent to do? And very often, if a boy, it's the consent to, to do what they've seen in porn. And, and this, to me, is one of the, the, the greatest public health crises of this generation because it's not just a, a matter of, and this is, this is really akin to the work that, I, that I'm doing around masculinity, it's not just a, around how porn impacts women and girls and the violent misogynistic pornography that impacts women and girls. We're not even close to talking about how this impacts the psychosocial development of boys because we're not even close to talking about sex in a very healthy way, in an honest way. And so we're not even looking at how it's impacting young boys who are accessing this information at a very early age and what the psychosocial development on them is. So um, can we go to the next slide? So um, this is the one. We can go past this one. I covered a lot of this already, um, but just wanted to make one um, one point about the, the last um, box there, which is we've completed toxic masculinity with being male. And, and just along what I, what I just said about how we're raising boys, I want to make a point about the term toxic masculinity. It, it is a problem. Uh, it's not a helpful com- uh, to- topic, um, but it is because the only ways in which we engage men around as- issues of masculinity are because of the toxic elements of masculinity that impact these issues. And as I just said a moment ago, if we are not having an, an honest conversation with young people about um, sexual violence and sexual behavior, then all of their behavior is going to be toxic because we're not teaching them how to do it in a healthy way. And, and so it's, it's really important that um, as we engage men in this conversation, um, we, we are, and this is going to sound, you know, to some people that, that we have to be more welcoming to men, but we do, and we have to provide an opportunity for, for men to unlearn a lot of things that we have learned. I have a, a chapter in my book titled 29, because I was 29 years old before I heard any of this from Jackson Katz um, in, in a way that, that made sense, in a way that it welcomed me into a conversation, as I said, that I didn't know that I was even a part of. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, and, and once again, that we, we don't have to go through this, and this was, this was um, but, but I will say that, that there, there is a, an element to what Me Too has done um, in a way that has engaged men um, in, a, in a conversation that uh, is more broad about what is, what, what's, what's men's accountability in, in, this, uh, in this conversation. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, and, and next, so getting into, into recommendations. Um, the first thing is someone asked about the, um, the different ways, the different things that we need to do I, and, and during the course of the academic year. And I believe that the, one of the first things we need to do is to talk about relationships in a very different way. All college students are in, and most of us, everyone on this call, in many ways, you're a part of a voluntary and involuntary relationships on a regular basis. You chose to, I chose to go to Syracuse University and play football. I did not choose my teammates. I didn't choose my classmates. I didn't choose my professors. I didn't choose the culture of Syracuse, New York. And so I'm in this voluntary relationship. I chose to come to this relationship, but now I have to navigate that relationship. Now I have to, I have to de- identify my values and how my values are being challenged or supported on a regular basis, how my belief systems that I come to, to campus are being challenged or supported in various ways. And I have to learn how to monitor that, how to navigate that. When am I wrong? When, am I, when, is, when is how I feel about something being challenged in a way that I'm uncomfortable? And is that growth or is that me being stubborn? And so it, it, it's, this is a very important, when I talk about how we navigate intimate partner relationships, um, obviously your belief system, um, what you want, what you desire, what you came to the room with, 
um, it all comes in with you, but then, then you have to navigate someone saying no. Then you have to get, navigate someone saying, I see it this way. That takes requires an awareness that we are all in these constant relationships that we are navigating. And, and to teach that, as I, as I always say, without the burden of the moment, right, going back to the intervention versus, advice, versus behavior. Uh, we have to teach, and it's a sad thing to say, but we have to teach people how to interact with one another. And I, in this generation, more than, other, than any other, is challenged with that because they don't talk to each other. They don't make eye contact. They sit right next to each other and text one another. And, and many people on this call, I'm sure, are probably doing that right now. You probably have a colleague who's in the next room and you're texting them uh, because you're saying, hey, can you get me a cup of coffee? Hey, can you – I'm still on this call, and, 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 we're, and we're texting. We get so, it's such a convenient way to communicate that we forget how to say, oh, I'm sorry, were you in the middle of something? Uh, let me wait before, you, before I ask you, before I invade your, your space and your time because of what I wanted in my very narcissistic iPhone, you know, uh, YouTube kind of way in this culture. And so we do have to teach them. Um, how to communicate one with one another, how to go on a date, how to ask someone on a date, how to do those fundamental things that are the, they're the stumbling blocks purposefully of relationships that, that slow down the conversation towards intimacy. I do a, 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 an example with students where I'll pick out a couple of students, a couple of men, and I'll indicate that I find a woman attractive, and then uh, I, I talk to her for 45 minutes. And it's, it's a hypothetical scenario. And I tell one of my buddies, I'm going to walk her to a car, and I'll be right back. And I walk her outside, and I, and I, I said, I don't come back. What are my buddies going to ask me the next day? And invariably, the entire audience assumes that I had sex because I met this woman. I found her attractive. I talked to her for 45 minutes. And I, I tell people that we've been on this call for longer than 45 minutes, and you all don't know if you want to talk to me after this call. Right, and so 45 minutes is not enough time to be intimate, and yet that's the assumption in this hookup culture. So the, what's happening is that we're, we're we're blowing right through all the natural speed bumps that are how relationships are grown and are nurtured, and that's one of the things that needs to be that needs to be taught. Um, next slide. Aspirational masculinity. So this is this is a term that that I. Um, and pushing uh, masculinities uh, is, uh, as it says there, accounts for the differences between and among men. So it's, it's the continuum. Men will believe that they own manhood, right? Don't challenge my manhood or i got to protect my manhood. Men will own manhood, but we don't own masculinity. We don't own the, the, the continuum that is the, 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 the men across the spectrum of what it means to be uh, a broad and whole man across the spectrum and, all, and to be uh, a male-identified person. What does that mean? I, I, was, I was talking to a, a trans woman last night about about the conversation um, within some of some of uh, her uh, friends and colleagues um, in the LGBTQ and, and trans community about um, understanding masculinity um, and, and how they talk about how how she and her colleagues were, were talking about masculinity in that way, which I found really fascinating about how we talk about masculinity, and that is uh, a conversation that broadens how we all talk about masculinity and so aspirational is a place that we intend to bring men and this is why I don't like terms like about toxic masculinity if we started the school year off and we said we're going to talk to men about toxic masculinity we've already shut down the conversation we've already said that, that masculinity in and of itself is wrong and toxic and we're going to ask you men to change and men aren't going to be engaged in October they'll hear that in September and they won't be engaged in October but if we talk about the evolution of masculinity and how we want to help men make better decisions with and among each other and how we're going to help improve their, the, the culture of their, their fraternity, help improve the culture of their teams uh, or, or their, their, the culture of their friends. Um, that's an engaging conversation. That's why I refer to uh, aspirational masculinity. Uh, next slide. So on, on campuses, one of the things that we very often do, and this goes back to one of the earlier com uh, questions about having students, um, as um, uh, I think someone said, the power of professionals um, and having students uh, involved in, in, in activism. And I mentioned this earlier about their students. And one of the things I did at, at, uh, at my modern Syracuse was, was to gather a group of men. As I said to you all earlier, there are, there are people who are, whether they're professionally in, in this field on campuses or if they're just on campus, there are 
and I just use Syracuse as an example, I gathered 17 men off the top of my head without even working on campus who I know are good people, who are good men who have been there committed to education in various ones works at facilities, the other one works at the chapel, the other one, you know, several, a couple of coaches and some professors and a dean. And they're all men who care. And, and so that is the, um, that's what that first group is, is those men. Let's not ask college men who very often don't figure it out until later in college, but some come in with an amazing sense of, of themselves to be the leaders. But how about we have men who actually set the standard on their campus as the example? And, and the other men who I was talking to a, a man the other day who's, who wa- always wants to bring students in the round, his family, so, he can, so they can see how he parents, that he's a responsible father, and that he's engaged in his family. Um, and so it, it, it's engaging those men um, uh, in the conversation as well, because they do really define what masculinity looks like on a particular campus. It's the men who, and this goes back to, to the point about um, all the, the, the settlements because of the silence of men. And it, it, it's the silence of men that allow, you know, I'm not happy about Syracuse being called the number one party school in the country. And that's because of the silence of adults who have allowed that to happen. Um, it's not the students who just showed up or who've been there for two years that all of a sudden were the number one party school in the country. It's, that, that's the silence of adults who've been incapable of, of wrestling that image away from, you know, the Princeton, Princeton Review or other people who want to say that we're the number one party school. So having adult men on campus is key to advancing the conversation because, as you know, students come and go, and if you're going to engage in, in a sustainable uh, leadership program with men on campus as the last box is a student organization of men. It has to have very specific goals. It has to be consistent with what I said earlier about having guiding principles, consistent with other programming you're doing on campus, uh, so that these men aren't just sitting out on their own trying to figure out how they fit into the campus culture. Um, but it has to be around, once again, that aspirational masculinity that is truly giving them something that they can uh, they can adhere to in, in their conversations. That is about making men better on campus and not just about going out and, and telling men that, that they're bad and that they're wrong and that they're the sexual predators. Um, next slide. This is, is um, what I said earlier, and, and I, I think I, you know, I've said so much about this when talking about pornography, um, is that we have to have um, a more honest, conversation. Um, I, I kind of jokingly, but at the same time, tell students that sex is amazing. It's wonderful. It's an incredible, most wonderful thing that, that human beings can do to be, to be intimate and vulnerable with one another. And yet, we only talk about it in its worst forms. We use violent language to, use it, to, to, to talk about it. We objectify each other in talking about it. And we, we, we have not given them uh, a good, honest understanding of what healthy and egalitarian sexual behavior looks like. We are, as a culture, still so afraid to talk about it, afraid to talk about the, all the elements of sex. And meanwhile, our kids are either engaged or, as I said earlier, in, in, in sense, sense of pornography, they're, they're, um, they're, they're exposed to it. And so there needs to be, as the question came earlier uh, about what's happening nationally, um, there are more and more states that, that are looking to how do we do sex education K through 12 in a more comprehensive, age-appropriate way? I do think that many people on this call are going to be responsible for that. We are now having state laws now uh, either being toughened, like the uh, child protection laws or, or workplace sexual harassment laws, that now there, there's now, now some legal teeth. Uh, and so we need to use those laws to say, okay, if, if these are the laws that we're asking – then we need to start moving in our education, educational programs in a more comprehensive and a more progressive way. And we have to stop being afraid to say the word sex, to talk about our bodies in ways that uh, we as adults are being silent and our kids are being exposed to more devastating and damaging understandings of sexual behavior than ever before because of their access to it. And, and we have to push that. And I do believe that everyone on this call, because I do believe there has to be a collective endeavor, uh, everyone on this call needs to be a part of that. Pushing this, and I, and I think this, as I said this earlier, and, and I'm, I could be, you know, obviously I'm a little biased to, to what I think on some of these issues, but I think this is one of the biggest issues uh, facing our culture because we don't know how to care about each other, we don't know how to love each other, we don't know how to communicate with each other, and it, and it comes out in some very, very dysfunctional and damaging ways in, in how sexual behavior is experienced. Um, next slide.
This is, and, and I believe this is the last slide, and this is something that um, those of you who are working with college campuses or thinking about working with college campuses, understanding that everything that I've been talking about um, is, is impacted and impact the entire campus from the moment they identify a, a high school student who is a potential recruit or a potential um, enrollee to their institution, we look at their profile. We look at if they're academically sound. We look at their transcript. We look at their, their, their test scores. We look at all these different ways in which we score for aptitude that makes them worthy of coming to our campus. We need to, to recognize that from the time they come to campus that, or the time that they're identified, that this is one of those other things that we should be looking for. Are these students, are your students engaged in programming in high school that's around these issues where they know, it's, and around a lot of things that we talked about, around healthy masculinity, around healthy relationships, what does that look like? Not just the, the kind of the prevention programs, the, but, but are they truly engaged in those programs? And we should score for that. We should, we should recruit the kind of students that we want. Uh, most campuses do a first-year experience. They bring students on campus. They kind of, kind of state, this is who you are, right? Where you have these campaigns where everyone signs off their, their email with, you know, go Bulldogs, go Orange, go whatever your mascot is to try to create some sort of solidarity, some sort of esprit de corps around your institution and what your sort of your philosophies are. Um, this should be a part of that. What, what does it mean to be a part of your campus community uh, in, in, in a respectful way when you talk about those voluntary and involuntary relationships? So it should be a part of that first year experience that we are talking about healthy relationships, communication relationships, healthy masculinity, all the things that, that, that we've been talking about. I say colleges because as a university and, and I say at large institutions, large universities that have multiple colleges or a single college, there are multiple departments. And each one of them, these, these issues, these guiding principles about what we look like as a campus manifest in all those different colleges in a little different way. And so all those different colleges have a, a, a place in this conversation. And, and I'll, let me just jump ahead to um, the, the – um, the, the employment piece um, and, and why recruitment to employment. The colleges are responsible for preparing students for the workplace. That's what they do. And there's, there are other people who help with student life. There are people who help in activities and, uh, and facilities and multiple. But the colleges are responsible for, for preparing students for the workplace. That's the point of higher education. And if the larger conversation nationally around Me Too and Time's Up and Press Forward and all these different uh, things that have come out of the Me Too movement, that have come out of the activism, are saying that this is a workplace issue, then that is, a, that, that is a number one incumbent upon higher education to prepare students for the workplace around these issues. If it is mandated in New York State that every company has to do workplace sexual harassment, then I wanna, if I'm that workplace, I want to go to the college that's doing this so I don't have to teach my employees how to be citizens within the workplace, how to not sexual harass within the workplace. I would hope that that's a, a fundamental skill that you have if you spent four years at XYZ institution, right? We have, we have, uh, we have adjusted to a global economy. We've adjusted to a, a technology-based economy. We've adjusted to, to, to media technology in so many different ways in the workplace and how the workplace has changed and evolved. We need to do the same thing here. And so it's up to the institutions to look at students from the time you bring them in to how you prepare them for employment. So this concept of, of recruitment to employment is something that I am really trying to get people to look at and, and recognize that the ways in which we have to talk about sexual violence to what I said earlier is not, and, and this is not to disparage what we're doing now, but I, I said flawed approaches. When you have two people in office that are charged with doing this for 14,000 students on, on a campus, a couple of campuses that I've been to of that size, this is when you have to engage your deans, you have to engage your faculty, you have to engage people who are in non-academic departments, all part of the solution. And this way you permeate the campus and make them realize what's in it for them. And so if you say, what's in it for, for people in facilities? Well, they're the ones who have to interact with students. They're also the ones who are going to cost you a billion dollars in that lawsuit because you've had someone in facilities management or you've had someone in the, in the health center, uh, as in the cases that I cited earlier, who's been um, abusing students for over years or, or other administrators uh, or other faculty over the years um, and all of a sudden now is, is being called to task. That's why it's important to include non-academic departments because they really are the biggest liability if you look at the numbers in, in settlement cases. So there's all these incentives, and we are a workplace. We being higher education is a workplace. So in New York State, you have to do this. If you're going to do this, don't just check a box. 
engage them, engage campus to be a part of the solution. And then you, you, you say to them, we want you to be a part of the solution, so we're going to give you the same education we give students. And we're going to talk about the same concepts that we talk about. How do you talk about sexual behavior? How do you talk about relationships? How do you talk about masculinity? How do you talk about these issues that we have historically, and I go back to the very beginning of this, that we have remained silent about, that has allowed this problem to continue. And if we are required as, as people in higher education to do this by law, then let's do it in a way that engages people and makes them part of the solution as opposed to just asking them to check a box and protect the institution. And I believe that's the last slide. Okay, so we had a couple questions pop up. Okay. I'm going to go back a little bit. Uh, what is your okay. perspective on, one person asks, what is your perspective on the Enough is Enough program in New York State? And do you see the prevention work having an impact on campuses, an impact on male students, and are there other successes in other states? I, I think I think any kind of broad legislative program um, that has sort of broad sweeping um, generalizations on um, how issues can be addressed. I, I think they're fine. I, I, I think, but I think it always comes down to how does the individual campus address it. And, and I would say that there are very few um, programs in that vein that I've seen that, that, that work. Um, I think New York State has always been pretty good, I, I think, in certain, in certain ways in terms of things like enough is enough and, and, and some of the laws that have just been tightened. Um, but I, but I, I go back to what I said earlier. I, I think that, that very often the problems are, are not those kind of legislative pieces. Um, it is the problem is, is 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 at the ground level, and what and what people are doing specifically on campuses or or not. And as I said, um, there is a there is a, a, a an absence of of a robust education on campuses. There's not, not just a matter of saying enough is enough. It's like okay, what then? What next? All right. Can you please say more about the bystanders in their affinity groups approach being more effective than um, something, say, something approach? Than the intervention approach? Yeah. Could you say a little bit more about that? They just want to ensure that um, they have it right. Make the distinction. So, again. so right. And so I'll, I'll give you, I'll give it to you in, um, in my personal life. And, and as opposed to, um, so I, I have a, a, a friend in, uh, uh, who is who has a daughter who is a first year college student. He has two other students, two other kids who are in college, but this particular daughter he's really um, uh, concerned about because of the school she's at and a few other things. And over the years, I, I met this guy through not through doing this work. He is, he's in he's in road construction. He's in a completely different space and field than I. I mean, we met as a part of a leadership program uh, on Long Island and um, became very cl close friends. And little by little, I talked to him every single day about these these, these issues. I talked to him in, in things that he knew nothing about. That his his attitudes and his behavior was was horrible. I didn't just say, "Oh, you're a bad guy," and not be friends with him. I would talk to him. I would, get, and and because we were friends, and because um, we were going to be friends, it wasn't a condition of our friendship. So when I talk about voluntary and involuntary relationships, it wasn't a condition of our friendship um, because I wasn't going to stop being his friend because he was ignorant about certain things that he had never been taught. And people say, "Why did you write?" You know, people ask me why I wrote a book. It's because you know there are things that people don't think about. And, and men who have not been challenged to think about it just don't think about it. So part of, of me being able to talk to him is to give him, to give him awareness over time, little by little, every single day. And now that he's dealing with his daughter as, as a first-year student on a college campus, he's going, whoa, he just sent me an article yesterday um, that talks about uh, sexual violence on college campuses and what should be the national response. And I don't even know where he got the article from. I was on the train, um, and, and he sent it to me. And so now he's engaged. And is it partially because his daughter's at that school? It's partially that, but it's also because he and I have been talking about it. And it, it doesn't feel threatening. And so part of and, and so now he's, he's in a better position to, to talk to his daughter, to talk to his son uh, about their behavior, because we've been talking about it. And it's not something that he's not all of a sudden realizing that, and because 
something happened with, with his daughter that was um, that he probably in, in the past would have been in a car on that campus in four hours. Instead, I helped him understand what was going on and helped him how do he, he, does he talk to his daughter about this, how does he deal with this, and he was much more understanding and was ba- able to help her in a much better way than just showing up as the, as the, you know, the dad with a bat in his hand, right? And so part of that was a, a, an ongoing conversation, and this is what bystander is. This is why I say how I got involved in this work. My book is a bystander book. My book is, is talking to men. I, I use a lot of my personal stories, which I, um, I was uncomfortable about many years ago, but it's the bystander moment. I am welcoming people into my world, and it's an unconditional welcome. I'm going to share with you my stories about football, my stories about growing up, my stories about my family. And in that building, that trust of communication, I'm also going to tell you, tell you why you throw like a girl is the epitome of sexism and misogyny and the core of violence against women and, and language that you use every single day. And then I'm going to help you understand and see that. And that's what bystander behavior was designed to do, not to stop the incident from happening. And, and once again, that is, you know, I, I, would, I will tell you very honestly, if I was – Walking down the street, and I saw a bank robbery going on. I'm not going to do anything about the bank robbery. That's why we have police. That's why the bank has insurance, right? I'm going to consider – I'm not getting in the way of that bank robber, right? I'm going to consider my personal safety. Now, I would not do that if, if it was an incident of sexual violence, clearly. However, I am going to – in that incident, I am going to consider my personal safety. And, and so what bystander the intervention does not do is it does not account for that. And so we're still weighing in what are my what's the risk to intervening in a situation as it's occurring. Now, when you talk about lang- confronting language, and, and, and that's also, um, if, if I am, it, it's one thing to confront people if you don't know them. It's a completely different thing to confront people if you know them. And if you know them, there's a strategy to confronting them. If you don't know them, there's no strategy. You're either going to be in a confrontation or you're not. But if you know them, there's a strategy for confrontation. And so that's what bystander behavior is. It's the strategy of confrontation of an affinity group that you do with people you know, who do with people that you're in that voluntary relationship with, do with the people who are part of your group where it's not a condition of your inclusion in that group. Right? Being, being an active bystander with my teammates was not a condition of being, me being on a football team. And so I have to learn how to do that. How do I intervene with my, with my teammates? How do I talk to them? And how do I engage them in, in, in this conversation in a way that opens them up to, to continuing to have the conversation? I hope that clarifies um, that difference. Yep. The next one is uh, the college students I train have asked me why I didn't tell them all of this in high school and why didn't their parents tell them. So we are looking to programs in high schools. What do you say about embracing what you are training, including honest discussions, especially about sex, at the very least combating pornography in school admin, oh, I'm sorry, in an 11-year-old year old iPhone, but in light of confines of high school admins, parents, social means, um, I think that means social social norms. Mm-hmm. What do you yeah. say we remain silent on, which in part got us here in the first place? So, and this is the this is why I say that collectively on this call, um, there has to be um, movement on this on this discussion. Right. We desperately need comprehensive, age appropriate, but also um, honest. Um, education around sexual behavior and around sex. We are still telling kids, and, and I heard this at a conference 20 years ago, and it stuck with me. It's 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 funny in 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 a, in, a, in, a, in the ironic way, but we still tell kids that sex is dirty, immoral, it's going to cause unwanted pregnancies, and STIs, and all these horrible things. And then we still tell them to save it for the one they love, save it for the special person in their life. It's the most confusing, ridiculous nonsensical BS thing that we constantly do with children. And that's got to stop. Because as soon as we start doing those things, we turn them away from the conversation. And, and you know, I, I had a, a, a friend who was a single mom and, and her 10-year-old boy, met him younger at the time, got caught with a bunch of friends looking at porn on an iPad. And, uh, and, she, and she called me. She goes, you know, what do I do? You know, what do I do? I'm trying to, be, you know, I'm trying to do the right thing. And I said, whatever you do, don't punish him. 
take a walk around the block, calm yourself down, and have a conversation with him about what he was looking at, what he was curious about, what, what, what drove him to that, why he wanted to see that, what did he see, how did he feel about what he saw, and, and, and allow him to tell you, allow him to talk to you about it. I have a, another colleague, and she, says, and she tells me that, oh, no, my son hasn't seen porn. And she goes, I said, okay. And her son's like, you know, like 12 years old, 11 years old. And she, says, and she asked me, you know, I'm trying to get him to talk about sex, and he won't do it every time I, I bring it up. He, gets, he has this really, like, almost violent reaction. No, Mom, I'm not talking to you about that. And I said to her, you know why he has that reaction? Because he's seen porn. And no way does he want to talk about that with his mom. Because that, what he's, what he's seen, is dirty and, and, and immoral and all the things that you told him and, and warned him that it was. And it was that. It was ugly. It was disgusting. And there's no way he wants to talk about the porn he has seen with his mother because it's not loving. It's not caring. It's not something that he would want to see his mother involved in. That's why he has such a, you know almost violent reaction to you wanting to talk to him. And if we have taught children that sex is loving and beautiful and caring, and what people who do, who care about each other, and who consider one another, if we have taught our children that, if we had taught young boys that, then porn would be so offensive to them on sight. But it's not. It has become their norm. And so the question about what do we do, and, and why didn't I hear about this when I was in high school, we are derelict as a, as a parent, as an adult culture, of teaching our kids this fundamental human behavior. And if you and I can, you know, we all know the reasons why, right? Parents are afraid to talk about it. Schools are afraid to talk about it because everyone thinks that means there's going to be orgies in, in the cafeteria. It's not going to happen. It is, the more we talk about it, the more normal we make it, the more respect they're going to give it. And, and we, we're so afraid to have this conversation. And in our fear, our kids are left adrift. All right, so the next question I would like to know your perspective on batterer intervention programs. The conversation around sexual assault always goes to prevention, but rarely talks about the life of those who have already assaulted or battered. Um, I, I went through a training many, many years ago um, and, and, and can very honestly say that I didn't get much out of it, um, probably because of the work that I've done since. Um, I had a colleague used to tell me that um, better, who was a, he was a trainer in a battery intervention program, and he re, he'd always talk about why they didn't work. He'd always talk about yeah, battery intervention programs don't work. Um, and, and I don't do, I'll be honest, I don't do a lot of work with battery inter, in, intervention programs um, or, or men who battered, but I do know that um, what needs to happen um, is a – a, a, a deep dive of therapy and understanding of, of where the behavior comes from. Um, that is 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 no different than than, than I you know than than working with addictions and that it's a, it's a daily process. Um, and I, and I and as I said, I don't do a lot of work with better intervention programs, so I um, can't speak to sort of where that that field is. Um, but. Um, I think there, there's a lot of work, that, and, I, and I think this. I think this, uh, in, in many ways, there's so much work that needs to be done um, with men in general, or along along the, the continuum of men who are whether they, whether they be abusers on on to to men who are uh, consider themselves good guys who don't need to do this and don't need to have these conversations. I think there's a continuum in that in that conversation, but I do think it's a very similar conversation. I I write about this in 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 my book in talking about my privilege as a man to not have to be a part of this conversation and, and um, cite a, a really horrific series of crimes in, in Canada. And, and I always say I had more in common with the perpetrator of those crimes than I did with women because I was a man that was raised in a, in a culture of masculinity that saw these behaviors um, maybe not as being normal and okay, but I was, I was silent about them and allowed that, that to, to continue to happen. And so I think, you know, just like with, with many ways that we deal with, with addictions, you, you, you deal with the individual, but you also have to deal with the culture um, in which they use and the culture in which it supports the behavior. And, and so um, I, I think the same thing is true with, uh, with, with, with batterers and men who abuse this. You have to look at the entire culture that, that raised them, that nurtured them, and that supports their behaviors and their attitudes. Um, 
just to piggyback on that, this is Dali Don. There, there are some um, models um, out there that actually work just in the very same way that you're describing, Don. That it focuses on what are, what is a healthy family, and and what is, um, you know, what are basically focusing on the solution versus what the problem is. I find that I that that, that doesn't work. These uh, intervention programs where we're just basically pointing fingers at men and telling them, you know, you're you're just been wrong. You shouldn't have hit. You shouldn't have done this. You shouldn't have done that. Versus talking about, well, yeah, where did you learn that? Where did that come from? And what what does that look like for your family when you're behaving? When these behaviors are exhibited, and what are better behaviors? What's a more loving, healthy family uh, circumstance than what you've been taught? It's acknowledging right. that you don't come at this from a I want to be a batter. I want to be, you know, abusive. That these are learned behaviors that we can undo by just educating you and giving you an opportunity to heal with your family. We, we are often all about punitive and ostracizing, you know, um, folks that may may have that or that cause harm. But that's not that's not the way that we're gonna heal as a society. Correct. So our next question is, what types of pro- – I'm going to move this along really quick because I know we're running out of time. Um, what types of program would you recommend for targeting male-identified audiences versus all gender audiences? Uh, I, I think it goes back to, to the conversation around um, the, the pressures that are placed on um, male-identified uh, uh, individuals around – the, the strict understanding of, of masculinity and how it how it pressures behavior, and I, I as I mentioned earlier, I don't like the term toxic masculinity, and, and so it's moving beyond that. But I think you have to talk about the pressures that we're under that keep us from a conversation that is more whole and allows each other to live in our authentic selves. And I think that's a that's a, a, a really important point because I think it, it you have to have that conversation. I think in within affinity groups or within groups of male identified people and, and then, you know, taken outside of that. But, but I do think that, that um, within our, within our, uh, and I like the term affinity groups because I think sometimes um, there, there are pressures that come from people that, who are closest to you who are in part of your every day. And this goes back to what I was saying about how do you deal with someone who's a battery. You have to get to the people that they're around, you know, on, on a regular basis. I think there, there is a, uh, a need to educate people how to allow people and we uh, to live in their authentic selves. And we are a culture right now that does not do that, does not model that, whether it's politically or, or in any other way that we don't allow people to truly express their wholeness and who they are. And, uh, and we're very quick to tell people, hey, as Dolly, as you said, you're wrong and you're bad and I, I'm right, you die, right? There's very little. And we have to teach that. We have to teach people how to be able to have uh, communicative relationships that allow people to live in their wholeness. Another question. As a sexual assault advocate, how do I bring knowledge to elementary and middle school age kids without working directly with schools? I'm thinking summer camps, sports settings during summer, et cetera. Exactly. I, I think, you know, schools are obviously the place where you can have systemic and uh, impact, so you can, you can work on grade levels. I worked in a, a leadership program for many years training high school students to go into elementary schools. And I did that for 18 years, and it was an amazing program. And, and uh, because what ends up happening is that the high school students translate the, the content in ways that, you know, fifth graders and, and fourth graders and sixth graders can understand. And they come from the same community, and, uh, and they can understand the content. So you're not always, you know, talking about sort of these big problems that you're trying to solve in, in one day, but you're really helping students have everyday conversations. And so you do have to give them some language that enables them to, to talk with one another, but that it's informed by a bigger strategy, a bigger uh, um, intent that the, 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 the content and, and the, the, the issues that you're dealing with will, will be more complex another time, not now, another time. Okay. Great. I think we are a little past time, so it's 11.35, so I'm going to end it here. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Don, for such a wonderful presentation. Your your knowledge and your points and what you're bringing to the table were, are just phenomenal. 
I think that you've brought a lot of voice to things that we often, like you so well um, said, um, don't talk about or, or aren't able to express how we really feel about the situation. And I think that you've definitely brought um, the perspective that we really needed to hear about how to best engage, you know, our men and boys in our society and have these tough conversations. Um, thank you so much, and thank you, everyone, for participating today. Just want to just one more time let you know, not please do not um, use any of the content discussed within this webinar presentation without the express permission of Don McPherson. And if you need more information or you need to contact him to ask more questions or, or if you need um, permission to use anything you've seen here, um, please contact him directly at his email address at dgmac9 at gmail.com. That's D as in dog, G as in go, M as in Mary, A as in apple, C as in Charlie, the number nine at gmail.com. Thank you again, and have a great day, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye now. Have a great day.